Well, I want to preach a message this morning entitled Accessing the Throne. And where I'm, where I'm coming from today is I'm under the opinion that we may, we may a bit understand what's been given to us through the blood of Jesus. We may kind of have our minds around it a little bit. But if we understand it, and I don't think we fully do, but even if we do a little bit, I don't believe that we utilize what's been granted to us in Christ. And so as it relates to accessing the throne of God. So what I want to do today is I want to kind of just work through this, I mean, shockingly awesome, you know, opportunity and gift that we have in that we are welcomed into the throne of God by the blood of Jesus anytime we want. I want to walk through the nitty-gritty of that to call our hearts to, to live this way, to not just sort of have that as, yeah, I know, I, I got access to the throne, but actually live this way. So some of you know the high church calendar today is the beginning of Advent. It's the, the time in which we prepare our hearts for the, the coming of the Lord, and, and we remember the, the birth of Christ, and we look forward to the second coming. And so today is the beginning of that season, and some will follow Advent calendars, and they'll use them devotionally. And um, as I was thinking about that and thinking about this message, you know, I don't know what could be more specific for this season than the idea that Jesus came to give us full access to the Father, that he came to tear down every wall of division between us and God and us and one another so that we could have audience with the uncreated God. I want us to just think about this. Now, I know if you've been in Christ any amount of time, you kind of get it, but let's just think about this again. You and I, we're weak, we're frail, we're subject to and prone to, to mistakes uh, we're prone to failure and sin, and yet, through the blood of Jesus, those of us that have said yes to Jesus' lordship, we have been granted a wide open opportunity to step into the throne room of God anytime we want, any day we want for as long as we want, forever. Now just think that through for just half a second. Unless you are a family member of a CEO or a high-powered political person, <laughs> there is no exalted office that you can just show up on your schedule, on your whim, and decide to step in because you felt like it. You don't just go up to Chick-fil-A tomorrow and go, I need to meet with Dan. Dan around, how do I get to Dan Cathy's office? Need to talk to him. I want a little more pickle on my sandwich. I, I'm, I'm, it's got a few things we need to talk about. That Popeye sandwich is kind of putting Chick-fil-A on the ropes. Dan and I need to have a combo. Like, that just doesn't work. You can't show up at Coca-Cola. You can't show up at the president's office, at the governor's office, but because of Jesus, you can show up in the throne room right this second. And here's the problem. There's many boundaries for us, and I'm gonna work through some of them today, but that idea is so colossal and awesome, and it's become cliche. And so I just want to try to just pull the curtains back and just kind of move some of the fog out and just remove some of the cliche for it because this season of Christmas, man, it wars on us, doesn't it? it it's busy. It's commercial so often. There's more parties than anybody can go to. And the, the, you know, the order of things oftentimes gets us askew from the Lord. But what if this season we just made it about the presence of God? What if we made this season about entering the throne room, engaging the Father, encountering his presence, his nature, his character, and allowing him to transform us all the way through this month as we get ready to launch into a new year? I think that would be an awesome way to spend this last month of this year. Amen. 
And so I want to work us through this. I, I want to talk a little bit about the throne. I want to talk about the access we have to the Father. I want to work through how it actually works because it's not this figurative thing. It's a literal thing. Then I want to talk about confidence that we're granted to come into that place, that we never have to come in fear or in, in shame. And then I want to sort of tune us to how we're supposed to set our minds as it relates to, to the throne. And so, so let's just jump into this. Um, I just think that this is the greatest wonder that the gospel was about bringing us to God. Ephesians 1 says that God wanted us to be before him in love. This is one of the key reasons that God became a man. It's one of the key reasons for Christ coming and dying on the cross is to, to rip the boundary and rip the barrier between us and God so that we could be with him. He's not this highly exalted king that just wants his subjects to stay at a distance. He, he, he's not trying to, to lord over us. He actually wants us in his presence and this is our portion. This is, it's our grand opportunity. It's our privilege that we actually get to live all of our days engaging him in his presence, you know, experiencing his nature, experiencing, you know, his thoughts and his perspective. And I just think that this, this concept of us who are weak having this, this opportunity, it can't be overstated how wondrous this is. He's uncreated, we're finite. He's exalted in power. I mean, we are so weak and he wants us there, beloved. And oh, I want us to get out of the cliche of this and to make this our, our normative habit that we would live before him all of the days of our lives. Now, here's the challenge. Sometimes we talk about, hey, you have access to the throne room of God. And what we do in our minds is we go, well, you know, that's like a spiritual thing. And then what we do is we say in our minds, we may not say it, we may not say it out loud, but we think spiritual equals figurative. And so we go, oh, I've got access to the throne sort of spiritually. And then we think it's figurative. And I want to tell you, this that I'm talking about is not figurative. It is spiritual, but it is literal. It's not figurative. And so a, a, a critical idea that we have to just sort of comprehend is that when we're talking about spiritual truths, they are literal truths. And when we talk about the throne room, it is a literal place. It's not sort of some you know, spiritual figurative place out there somewhere. It is a literal place. And this begs the question, how do the heavens and the earth kind of relate? Because we understand that, that God is real, right? Right? And, 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 and we, 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 we get it, like we don't see him, but he's real, he's literal. And Jesus is really at the right hand of the Father. And he's spatially sitting on the Father's right side. And there is a throne room, Revelation 4 and 5 make it super, super clear. And there's space and distance, and this is even hard to comprehend, there's physicality in that place. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean, John, when he goes there, he sees the Father, and he's sitting. You don't sit if you're a wispy cloud, ghosty figure. But the Father has corporality. He has a physical body in which he's able to sit on a real throne. And this will bend your mind a little bit, but just because it's spiritual doesn't mean that it's not physical. What am I telling you? I'm telling you, if you stepped through the veil from the earth into the heavens, the heavens is just another way to say into the spirit. If you stepped through the veil, the physicality of that place would be as real as the physicality of this place. That throne room is real. That throne is real. Those lamps of fire before the throne are real. Those living creatures really do have six wings, and those wings really do flap. And when they really say holy, it's really heard in the throne room. 
And the sound really travels through the atmosphere, comes out of one mouth and into your ear, and you can actually hear it when you're in that place. There really is a sea of glass. There really are seven lamps of fire. There really are 24 elders on their own thrones with their own crowns and their own robes. That place is real, beloved. And this is what we have access to. There's real lightning coming out of the Father. There's real thunder coming out of him. He really does look like a jasper and a sardius stone, like like jewels. He looks like gemstones in light. He's glorious and majestic and fiery and wondrous. And that place is a place of pleasure and power and, and, and peace and perfection. And this is what we have access to. And the fact that we would ever be bored entering into that place is a mind blower. It must be that we don't actually believe it. Because if you believed it, You'd step into that place and that theater of divine entertainment and all of your senses would begin to get pinned to 10. And this is what I want to reset our hearts and our minds on, that when you close your eyes and you say, Father, that is where you are. And our challenge is that often that we kind of just get into this mode of, yeah, yeah, I've got access to the Father. I can just pray whenever. And we almost have this mentality that we're, our prayers are a Frisbee, and we're sort of like, hope it gets there. Don't break your thing. Hope it gets there. <laughs> Do a little bit more. Uh, anyway. And it's like, we, we're, it's like we're, if we chuck it really hard, and say the exact right words, perfect form, then the disc will actually make it to the throne room somehow. And I'm telling you, that's not how it goes at all. How it goes is you close your eyes, and in one second, you're on the sea of glass. You're instantly on the sea of glass. There's not even a second. It's just you're there. Why? Because this is your station if you are in Christ. You have access to the throne room, not a figurative, a literal access. I like to explain it this way. When I talk about the heavens and the throne room and the unseen, I like to explain it this way. It's as physical on that side as it is on this side, but there's a veil in between. And from their side, the veil, you can see both sides. From our side, the veil is like a mirror. All we can see is this side. Oh, but when the veil gets torn back, the angels, the realm of of heaven, the throne, all of that is physical and literal. Jesus ascended, think about this, bodily somewhere. Did he lose his body on the way up? No, he passed through the veil and he sat at the right hand of God. Beloved, it is as real as anything. It's as tactile and physical as anything on this side. In fact, it's even more so because the throne of God is the epicenter of all reality. The closer you are to the throne, the closer you are to reality, the further you are from the throne, the further you are from reality. It doesn't matter who you are. You could be the president of a nation. If you are distant from the throne, you are outside of reality. But as you are closer to the throne, you are in to what is real and what is central in all creation. Am I making any sense? And and, and so this is what I want us to to think about and, and what I want us not just to think about, but to contact. Believers have access to the throne. Now, it would be wondrous if you had a VIP pass to the Oval Office in the White House. If you could be a fly on the wall, you would probably be be the most successful blogger on the planet because you would hear so many interesting conversations. You you would have so many stories to tell just to be a fly on the wall in the Oval Office. What if you had it for decades, president after president after president, you could tell all the stories unfiltered. I mean, it'd be shocking, right? And I want to tell you, you've got something more than a VIP pass to the Oval Office. 
you have access to the throne of God. But here's the point, not just to be a fly on the wall, because it's not just access to the room, it's access to the one. And that is a different deal entirely. It would be glorious if the blood of Jesus granted you access to the throne and you just stood there and were in shock. A living creature like eagle head saying, holy, 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 six wings with eyes all over. You'd be like, whoa. And then here goes eagle head. There goes lion head. And here comes ox head. I mean, you'd be like, what is going on in this place? Fire, glory, light, wonder, beauty. If you were just, if you were just a bystander in the throne room, that, w- that seems like that would be just plenty. You sort of walk in, just take your place on row 73 with all the angels and just freak out. But that is not what you've been granted. You've got entrance, but then you've also got audience. Think that through for a moment, beloved. I want your prayer life to change. And everything you need for an amazing prayer life has already been purchased because none of what I'm talking about is on the basis of your own virtue. It's not on the basis of your own ability. It's not on the basis of anything you can conjure or work out. It's not on how good you did the last month or the last 12 hours. It has nothing to do with your own virtue. It has everything to do with Jesus and what he purchased on the cross. We have the best deal going. We've got the best story, the best God, the best promises, the best redemption. I love Christianity. God's brilliant. Amen. So I'm operating on the premise that maybe we understand it a little bit, but probably not that much. And maybe we access this a little bit, but probably not that much. And here's what I tend to think. The Bible says, Ephesians 2, we've been seated in heavenly places in Christ. And the purpose is stunning that God could show us the riches of his kindness and grace for ages. That's just a whole other series of messages, but we won't go there. But the purpose of God lifting us up is because he wants to be kind to us. But he's, he's actually seated us in this place. This is, where, this is our, where we live. It's our audience. And I'm under the, the mentality that we're supposed to live from that place into this place. Not from this place trying to get to that place. Or from this place sort of trying to relate to this place. And what I tend to think is Christians tend to live from the earth to the earth or from the earth to the throne instead of from the throne to the earth. And I believe that we have in Christ the wondrous privilege of being able to live from that place into this place. That's who we are. That's what we've been granted. This is what I want to walk through. Okay, so Ephesians 2.18 I just want to be blown away with this some more. I love reading the Bible, and I love allowing it to blow my mind. I used to read the Bible to check it off my list. I will encourage you, don't read the Bible to check it off your list. Read the Bible to let it blow your mind. I remember the first time I read about one of the relatives of Goliath, and he had six fingers on each hand and six toes. I was like doing my daily reading. I was like, yeah, six fingers, six toes. Huh? I was like, whoa. That guy had like lots of stuff going out. Like, and it, I, just started, I just started picturing it. And I'm like, that kid at show and tell every week, he was like, I got another thing to show y'all, you know. I mean, just crazy. And I, and I was getting my mind around it thinking, the stuff that's in this word is mind-boggling, but we read it like it's the daily stock report. Well, this one's up, futures are down. And instead of allowing it just to explode wonder in our soul, I love reading it slowly, phrase by phrase, 
verse by verse, allowing the verses to just take residence in me and then picturing what the verses say. Don't read it like you're trying to win the speed reading competition to get your box checked on, did you do good today? I read my Bible. Don't do that. Read it verse by verse, phrase by phrase. Let each phrase roll over your mind. Ephesians 2.18, this is one of those. I've just been chewing this this week. I, I love this passage. It's perfect Trinitarian theology. We see the Father, Son, and the Spirit all working in perfection. For through him, this is Jesus, through Jesus, we both, this is talking about Jew and Gentile, have access by one Spirit to the Father. Through Jesus, we have access by the Holy Spirit to the Father. Through Jesus. How does this thing work? When Jesus Christ when he died on the cross and shed his own blood, the book of Hebrews describes this amazing thing that happened. When he ascended to the Father, he actually brought his own blood into the real throne room. And whereas the, in the human temple and in the tabernacle that, that Moses built, there was the sacrifice of animals and the application of blood in those places to sort of cover sin. Jesus, the writer of Hebrews tells us, he actually went into the real one. Remember, those are just copies of the real one. This place is a physical, literal place. He went into the real one as the high priest for all humanity and presented his blood to the Father to cover and cleanse the sins of every human who would say yes to his sacrifice. What a shock. Today, you are standing right with God, not on the virtue of anything you've ever done, but on the virtue of that one sacrifice that Jesus made for all mankind for all time, his own blood offered to the Father. In the kingdom of God, the high priest who officiates the altar is also the sacrifice upon the altar. Oh my gosh. And so when he offers his blood to the Father, everyone that would say yes to Jesus' sacrifice then comes in through Christ under the blood. You and I right now have blood on us. The blood of Jesus is on you if you're in Christ. This was the purpose of the cross, that he would put his blood on us and that we would be able to step right into the throne room of God and no one's checking our ticket at the door. No one's carding us. There's no ID check. There's no holiness check. There's no, hey, are you, what are you? There's blood on you and you come right on in. Now I'm gonna explain how this works in the areas of our own weakness in a minute and it's gonna blow your mind. But you and I walk right on in through him, we have access by one spirit, the Holy Spirit, to the Father. So how does this actually work? I'll tell you how it works. You stand there and you say, Father, and the blood of Jesus that's on you gives you instantaneous access to that real place. Now, personally, I like to close my eyes because I get distracted easily. <laughs> so I close my eyes. And I say, Father, and the blood of Jesus upon me grants me the access, but watch this, it says, by the Spirit. Because you go, how can I be there, here and there? How can I speak here, but I'm there? How can I be seated there and I'm, on my, and I'm feeded here? How does this work? By the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit actually is the bridge, he actually connects you to that place. So the Holy Spirit, he's the one that actually is the, the transport, so to speak, into that place. You close your eyes, you say, Father, and Holy Spirit puts you right there. This is the power of God working in the life of the redeemed. It is a shock to me. And so this idea that there's blood on us, man, what a deterrent to sin. I don't want to sin because I've got his blood on me. 
What another deterrent to sin? I don't want to get into sin because I have pure, perfect access to him. And then when I close my eyes and I say, Father, Holy Spirit, he transports me right there. And I have the audience with the Father. I'm not just a, 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 you know, a fly on the wall. I'm actually there and the Father is listening to my voice. And this is you and this is me. No one ha- has a, a better shot at getting in. No one has like, uh, they did more spiritual calisthenics so they're in better shape. No. Every believer, you say, Father, boom, you are right there and his eyes are on you. Oh, beloved. This is amazing. He's uncreated. We're finite. He's all powerful. We're weak. He's beautiful. We're, uh, I mean, this, and we get to go right in. This is amazing. It has no basis on anything that you've done. It's all on what Jesus has done. And then when we show up, again, we have access to the person, and the person is kind and merciful and loving and tender and generous and welcoming. We don't show up in the throne room and he goes, all right, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Do you understand? I've got Syria to deal with. Have you seen the Middle East lately? Come on, hurry, 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 hurry. He's not doing that. He's going, hey, you are here. Yes. I love this. You're like, what is this? Me and you, I love it. You're like, you love this. He goes, yes. And, and, and he just, he'll just sit there. And you're like, do, do I need to do something for you? He's like, no. Uh, don't, don't you want me to perform something? No. I'm just glad you're here. Ephesians 1 says that we would be before him in love. It doesn't say that we would do all sorts of spiritual stuff for him in love. That we would be before him in love. So we get into that place, and we go, Father, he goes, yes. And for me, at that point, my prayer list usually melts. It disintegrates. You know, I show up with all the things I think I need and all the things everybody else needs, and I go in that place, I go, Father, and a smile comes over his face, and he's looking at me, and I go, Father, and he goes, yes, and the glory and the wonder of this one who wraps himself in light like a garment is pouring out over me, and I realize there's no veil, there's no hindrance, and he wants me. He doesn't want something I can do. He wants me, and I go, Father, he goes, yeah, and I go, holy My prayer life consists mostly of one word, holy. I use other words too, but that's the main one, holy. And then I say yes a lot, yes, yes, holy. Beloved, this is what we get to do all day, every day, at our own whim. This is Christianity. I like to call it the theater of divine entertainment. You know, that, that place of just wonder and brilliance and sight and sound and glory and beauty and love and pleasure. And, and this is what I realized. Every natural entertainment, it always tickles that desire on the inside of me, but it never fulfills it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, like I, I'm a Bulldogs fan. We crushed Georgia Tech. God bless you, Georgia Techans. We crushed him yesterday, and it's great, but I just, you know, it's not, it's not enough. I mean, we have to crush LSU too, but I mean, but there's more than that. It's, it's testifying to me that there's more than a little human entertainment that's fleeting and, and natural, that there is a realm of divine entertainment that's far beyond anything I've ever dreamt of. There's excitement and glory and beauty and wonder and shock and awe just in his person, in his being. And that's what he wants to impress me with. When I get before him, he wants to share with me his nature, share with me his heart and you 
and his perspective. And that's what we need right now more than anything. We need his perspective. We need what he thinks. I've been thinking about the way the phone works and the way the throne works. A little preacher rhyming here. Just hang with me. But this phone thing, you know, you go to the phone and now it opens up this place of pleasure and wonder and thought and ideas and entertainment. And people, uh, you know, it's very normal for people to be addicted to their phones. Easy. To sh- you know, the, now the phone has apps to show you. You're addicted to it. <laughs> and, and the thing is, it's touching these pleasure centers in our soul and even in our physiology that were made to be touched by the throne and not the phone. <laughs> And that phone opens up all these things that it's just stimulating everywhere. And what we don't realize is we're made for something so much greater and we've been anchored now to something that's so finite and digital and false. And man, I'm looking at my own phone usage and I'm going, I don't want the phone, I want the throne. I want your presence, I want your glory, I want your beauty. There's nothing in that little chocolate bar that is gonna get my heart to to experience love and wonder. But you, you alone. And that's what he wants. He wants us to come and be with him in his presence. He doesn't just want us to have access to the room. Angels have access to the room. His children have access to his heart. And this is us. This is what we get to do. Several years ago, my kids were little. My boys were little. And uh, I remember I I did like a 12-hour day uh, you know, in the ministry, just, just people, meetings all day, just, you know, you just get, you just get worn out, you know, and I came home, and it was like 6.30, 7 o'clock, and, and they wanted to wrestle, and I'm sitting in my chair, and I'm kind of doing the one-arm wrestle, like, yeah, you know, and one of them said, hey, can I get on your lap, Dad, and I went, oh, buddy, I'm so tired, and instantly, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, you're always allowed on my lap. You're always allowed on my lap. And then he said this, there's gonna be a time when they won't ask you to get on your lap anymore. I wanna tell you, report, that that time has come. (laughs) (laughs) And I wanna thank God for that publicly. I didn't raise Elf as my children. Let the reader understand. But in that moment, it went right through me because I realized the father is never saying not now. He's always saying welcome, always welcome, always welcome, always welcome. That is so huge. Always welcome. How important is he? The most important, right? Always welcome. So I have this little picture. Go ahead and throw it up there. This was uh, about four years ago. Uh, we were celebrating our 10th anniversary here. There she is. A little booger face. Five years old. Ice cream cupcake. And uh, so I'm up here. This is our 10th anniversary. It's right here. And I'm up here doing the announcements. And it's like, you know, the conference. And it's like packed to the walls. It's like... 800, 900 people crammed in this room. And it's a big moment. And we got people from all over the, the nation in. And I mean, it was a big, big deal. It's our 10th anniversary of 24 7 worship and prayer. And we hadn't been in a, in a, in a room like this because we've been mostly in the house of prayer. And, and so something in my little daughter, she's five, and she sees me up here and she wanted to be up there too. And so she just came scampering up. And I didn't even notice. I was looking this way and I looked, and here she is. And I remembered that moment when the Lord spoke to me and he said, I've never said not now to you. And I just wrapped my arm around her. And that little face, it tells you everything you need to know about being confident in the Father's love. He's never said not now. He's always saying welcome. He's always saying come on in. 
And I just remember that moment. I love this picture, but I just remember that moment. You can tell I'm a little skinny right there. That vein is pretty intense. But <laughs> a little 40-day fast post picture. But I remember that moment, and, and it just makes me think about how we have entrance no matter what's going on. And I want, you to, I want you to get that. You have audience and you have entrance no matter what, at all times. It doesn't matter how intense the moment is. The father never says no. You can remove that. She's now distracting all of us. <laughs> he wanted all of his kids to have access to him, to his heart, his thoughts, his perspective, his will, his counsel, his character, his nature, his power. He could have done this thing any way. He could have just made it, you're saved. I don't really want to talk to you for another million years. It's not what he did. Instantly, he gave us access. Instantly, his eye is on us. His ear is attentive to us. Instantly, if you're in Christ, the blood of Jesus makes the way and the Holy Spirit provides the transport. You're really there when you close your eyes and you say, Father, you're really there. And I want to talk about being confident. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, he breaks this all down theologically. I mean, I would encourage you, if you never spent some time in Hebrews, spend like three to six months just working through the book of Hebrews. It's so powerful and potent as it relates to the, 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 the typology of the Old Testament and what we have in the New as it relates to the access of the Father, access to the Father and the throne. But Hebrews 10, I want to read this, verse 19 it says, therefore, brethren, this is, I, I, want us to under, I want to underscore this confidence and boldness idea. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. We understand when Christ was crucified, the veil of the temple was, was torn in two. Well, when Jesus was crucified, there was another veil that was torn into his own flesh. And through the tearing of his flesh, it's just that symbolic picture of the tearing of the natural veil of the temple into the Holy of Holies. The tearing of Christ's flesh enables us to come through into the holiest of all, into the throne room of God. The ta- uh, he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest, that's Jesus over the house of God. He says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith. Boldness and full assurance. And I gotta be honest with you, I don't like how many preachers preach this. They, they'll say, you just gotta go up there and just tell God whatever, whatever you want. And I'm like, No, that's not what that's saying. What that's saying is because of what Christ did, you don't have to walk in there full of shame and insecurity. And I'm convinced you may understand that there's access, but so many believers stay out of the throne room because they are so full of shame and so insecure that they think when they're walking in there, they're like, oh man, here I come, and man, I didn't do all my spiritual push-ups, and I'm just not ready for this, and eh, please don't strike me down. You may never say that, but you feel it. And the scripture is absolutely clear. Everything that's necessary for you to get that instantaneous access has already been done, and it's not on your own merit. It's the blood of Christ. You are cleansed by the blood of Christ. You are granted the audience by the blood of Jesus, not by your own works. You don't get better access if you read the Bible 10 hours a day. You don't. You may believe in your access more, but you don't get better access. The guy that's one second into salvation and the dude that's been saved 50 years, they have the exact same access. It's the blood of Jesus. You're right in by the blood of Jesus. And that's what the scripture is saying. Because of the blood of Christ, you can just walk in there confidently. Here I am. I have to counsel believers so often. God's not surprised at your weaknesses. He's not shocked by your sin. 
You know, we treat our sin as if it's something that just God never saw coming. Like he loved us yesterday when we were pure and holy, but today, you know, we've been wrestling and God's going, dear God, I had no idea. You're like really gross today. I never saw that coming. It's not the case. When you were feeling his nearness and his presence and his love yesterday, he knew you were going to step in the stuff tomorrow. And he was encountering you to give you courage that when you step in the stuff, you can still walk right back to him and go, help. And we don't go walking into him going, I got my sin and whatever. No, we go into the throne going, here I am, cleanse me. This bold confidence, this this full assurance of faith, it's about coming out of shame and stepping right into that place that you're created to live. Hebrews 4, this is so clear. And and, and I, I wanna read verse 15, Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. It's so clear. So often I've heard this preached about you just gotta just Go in there boldly and tell God what your needs are and just go by faith and get your needs met. And that is not what this is saying. It's actually saying when you're sinning, go in boldly. Because going to the throne when you're in sin is the act of repentance because you can't go towards God and towards sin at the same time. It's calling us to confidently and boldly repent by running to the throne of God. Hebrews 4, verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore, because Jesus has been through all of it, And he said no to every temptation. He goes, now, he's been through all of it and he's overcome all of it. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace, what? That we may obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. Let me ask you, when do you need mercy? When you've messed up. This is not about showing up with your list of needs going, I need God to do this for me. God, you've got to do this. I'm being bold with you. It is not what this is. This is when you've messed up to get mercy. Boldly come in. He goes, come and get it. The Lord, the Lord God, when he said his name to Moses, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful. Mercy pre-understands that you have done something wrong. The need for mercy, it's based on the idea that you've done something wrong. When Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, and and he called us to be merciful, he was explaining to us that people are gonna do you wrong. Be merciful. Because that's exactly how the Father is. Come and receive mercy. Come boldly and receive mercy. See, when we preach this thing the way it really is, then you end up having to say what Paul had to say. What shall we say, what, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be. See, Paul was preaching such a rich grace and such a powerful blood of Jesus that people were actually taking him out of context and thinking, we can just sin all we want and it's totally fine. And Paul goes, no, may it never be. How can you who have died to sin live any longer there in it? But his point was that when we do sin, you can boldly come in because you've got access and the attention and the audience of the Father. You can boldly come in and get every sin cleansed. And beloved, this is our portion. Man, I want to live in that place of audience and interaction. I want to live in that place of being sourced by his wonder, his beauty, his grace, his love. I want this season of Advent to be a season of presence, not gifts, presence, where we're engaging God. We're standing before him, and we're coming into our identity as sons and daughters. 
that's what this can be for us. Last thought, last verse, Colossians 3. Oh, man, I'm going to get us, we're going to beat the Baptist today. Glory to God. (laughs) Colossians 3. God bless the Baptists. But they're going to be last at the buffet. Hallelujah. I've said that joke for 25 years. It still works. Colossians 3, look at this. Paul wrote Ephesians and Colossians at the same time, so the themes in both books are very, very, very similar. Ephesians 2, he he explains how we are raised and seated in heavenly places. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Now we've been raised and seated in heavenly places in Christ. Colossians 3 says, Now if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Seek those things which are above. Set your mind on things which are above. Whoever said, I don't know who it was, but whoever said, you know, the guy's too heavenly minded to be any earthly good, that guy hadn't read Colossians 3 because the clear admonition of Scripture is to seek the things that are above in the throne room and to set our mind on those very things. See, when we do this, when we pursue the throne, when we pursue the kingdom, everything else that we need naturally will be added to us. But what he's inviting us to is the transformative power of God mixed with the word of God that changes us on the inside so that it can manifest through us. So when we seek the throne, what happens is you come before the throne and the wonder and the glory of that place begins to permeate you. The joy of that place begins to fill you. The pleasure of that place begins to fill you. The peace of God in that place, it begins to fill you and overwhelm you. And the perspective from the throne room changes the way that you look and think about things on the earth. We have no reason to ever worry. Wow, that was a weak That was a weak amen. Think that through for a minute. Because we're seated with him in heavenly places, and the throne is the highest throne above everything else, infinitely higher above every other throne. And we have perfect audience with him at all times. We have no reason to worry. We have him. We, we don't need anyone else on our team. We don't need one other person. Look who we got, God. Y'all got Lucifer, Goliath, Hitler, whoever. Doesn't matter, we got God. And he's not on our team, we're on his team. <laughs> It changes your perspective. It changes your emotions. Our challenge is we're living from earth to earth. And we're living from earth to the throne. And we need to be living from the throne to the earth. With a perspective that's from that place, that's from our Father. How do you get that perspective? You seek and you set. There's a pursuit and a meditation. There's a a setting of your mind. And it's, it's, not, it's not even rocket science. I mean, it's easy. Anybody could do this. The Bible gives us real clear details of what's happening in the throne room. Now, I don't think it's every detail. I think it's just enough for our minds to get around it. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm talking about the beauty of the throne and get into some of those details. But the Bible gives us such clarity in the detail of the throne that you can easily 
remember the details. You can close your eyes and gauge those details with your mind. And all of a sudden, God is now anointing your imagination and you are picturing yourself in the very place that he says you have access to. And somebody goes, well, that sounds like visualization. Look, they stole it from God. He said, set your mind on things above. So if I'm going to set my mind, then I'm going to use what God gave me, divine imagination. Why did he give me all those details if he doesn't want me to picture it? He said he's like a jasper and a sardius, and there's thunders and lightnings and voices. I mean, if he didn't want me to picture it, he should have said, it's cool (laughs) and loud and things. Things are awesome. They're mighty up there. But instead, he gave detail. Why? So that it would engage us. It would engage our perception. It would engage engage our senses. That place, I mean, you, listen, the most wildly wonderful symphony, the greatest sounding music, the greatest orchestral choir that you've ever heard on the earth, it is, the Bible says, everything on this side is a shadow compared to what's real. In that place of wonder with myriads of saints and angels, millions and millions and billions with sights and sounds and wonder and beauty and glory, you think the music on this side even holds a candle to what's coming off of that place? Oh my gosh, no, that's the place of wonder. Everything on this side is a shadow. The beauty that we experience looking at the stars, looking at the sunset, looking at the mountains, at the sea, at the snow, all of that beauty, a shadow compared to the real. It all, the heavens declare his glory. Where is his glory from? His throne. Set your minds on things above. Seek those things, the right hand of God. See, we're supposed to live this way so that when the stock report comes out and it's a mess, we don't care. And when the political banter starts flying like it's about to start flying, we don't care. Because I don't care who's on the throne of the United States because I know who's on the throne of all created order. Do you see? And I get that perspective. I don't care what any news outlet says. I don't care what any Twitter feed says. None of that matters. What matters is what do you say? You who are highly exalted, most high God. You who love me ever still. You have given me access to your own presence and your throne. What's your perspective? This is how we're to live, beloved. Amen? Amen, amen. All right, let's stand.